Thomas H. B. Simons was a man who embodied the motto of the university that he founded. The words, Nunc cognosco ex parte, now I know in part, framed his life, but also a wider compelling pedagogy that underscored the importance of self-improvement, humility, and social justice through higher education. His curiosity for the world around him was surpassed only by his compassion for others. He particularly enjoyed conversations with young scholars and took great interest both in their studies and their post-university careers. His own career took him across Canada and around the world, but he always considered Peterborough home. From Marchbanks, his beloved residence, formerly owned by Robertson Davies, Professor Simons created a base of operations while raising three successful children with Christine, his wife of 57 years. Professor Simons was born in Toronto in 1929 to First World War flying ace Harry Lutz Simons and Dorothy Bull, daughter of financier and historian William Perkins Bull. Educated at the University of Toronto Schools and the University of Toronto, he later attended Oriel College, Oxford. Professor Simons returned to the University of Toronto, where he was a tutor in history at Trinity College and later Dean of Devonshire House, an all-male residence that he reinvigorated in the collegiate style. During these years, he also taught both ancient and Canadian history, demonstrating his characteristically eclectic mind and breadth of knowledge. His experiences at the U of T especially helped form his philosophies on education, scholarship, and student engagement, which would guide him throughout his life. At the age of 32 in 1961, Professor Simons was approached by a committee of Peterborough citizens who asked him to create a university for the city. He accepted the daunting challenge and became the founding president of what would be Trent University. His vision for Trent as a fully formed collegiate university brought the institution to life and has sustained it for more than 55 years, a place where everyone would know everyone else and all members of the community would intermingle and interact. Tom Simons and I talked a lot about the creation of Trent University. It's something that is near and dear to me in my work, working with collegiate universities around the world. And I would often ask him, so were you trying to create an Oxford? You know, they called it the Oxford on the autonomy. Did you want to create a new U of T? And he actually said, no, I'd gone to Oxford and I'd gone to the U of T and they'd sort of lost the wheel. They were not the universities that they were meant to be. And so in creating Trent, he wanted to recreate the essence of what was supposed to be behind the collegiate experience in Oxford and supposed to be behind the collegiate experience. And what is really special about Trent is it was a purpose-built collegiate university. Most collegiate universities, the ones we know of, you know, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, Durham in the UK, took hundreds of years to become a collegiate university. New colleges were built and added on, changed. Trent was purpose built with its colleges and meant to come out and hit the ground running. And I think that is a great legacy, this idea of a purpose built collegiate university where collegiality was always at the center. It wasn't something that the university came to realize. It was in its DNA at this collegiate sense. Tom's vision for the, the college system and the multidisciplinary approach to learning uh, which is the backbone of Trent University, that's a legacy that should well endure for centuries. There are so many fond memories of Tom. I was there on the shores of Champlain College when Tom was addressing the students and suddenly decided to dive into the Otonabee River, fully clothed in his suit, still smoking his pipe, still wearing his watch and wallet, and I was there when he officially opened the bridge across the Otonabee River, joining east to west. And there when uh, we ran across a frozen curved lake towards the reserve at the end of an 11K run. Uh, but my favorite memory was being one of the organizers of the student demonstration back in the 60s, when nearly half the university marched on his offices to plead with him to stay on as president of the university and not to accept an offer to go to a very high profile appointment in Ottawa. I'm so glad to think that we were able to let Tom know directly, even way back then, how much we appreciated and admired his vision for the university and how much we appreciated and admired him personally. Tom was um, brilliant 
at engaging with the students. He knew all of our names. I've never been able to figure out how he was able to do that. But from the very earliest days, he'd go up and he'd address you by name. He was a leader, but he was a leader in a very uh, interesting way. He was a gentle man. He was very reserved and quiet, but he had this vision for Trent University. And we all got imbued with that vision. So we followed him like a leader. He wasn't out there, you know, his arms waving and being a demagogue. He was just quietly doing his thing, engaging with all of us. And we did follow him like a beetle, like a rock star. He was a very big man with a very big vision that encompassed and incorporated everybody else's vision. He was most curious about you and what you wanted to accomplish in life or what project you were working on and how he could encourage or be useful. The early days of Trent, um, the ec educational system and the commitment of all the people at the university was astonishing. And the word I think of when I think of Trent, and it's not entirely an appropriate word because it has another meaning, but convivium. It was a convivial place, and we were in a convivium for many of the first few years when professors and students and staff, uh, uh, academic and support, were friends of each other, knew each other, knew each other by name. These were very personal experiences and uh, very powerful uh, and I uh, stood me through life uh, about how I, how an education should be approached. When I uh, think of Tom, I don't think of him as a distinguished scholar or statesman or historian or any of that. I just think of him as the man whose dream became a reality for all 102 of us in that first class. Um, you know, and he was he was the man who greeted us uh, uh, all by name, actually. Uh, in those first few days at Trent, and uh, he made us feel, even then, that we were going to be a, an integral part in making his dream a success. But we watched and learned from him in such intangible ways. Like it was his calm demeanor, his non-confrontational style, his great sense of humor, his genuine interest in people from all walks and stations in life and his determination to achieve his goals always expanding to reach new horizons like he was always looking ahead and you know through tom we were introduced to politicians authors musicians scholars and those were opportunities that we would have never have had my first experience meeting tom as for many was a, a memorable one i arrived at trent as an undergraduate in 1966 bright-eyed bushy-tailed and I was invited to a sherry party to meet the faculty and other students. And I look over incoming, here comes Tom Simons, who was already a legend in my mind. He stuck out his hand, said to me, Don Tapscott, welcome to Trent. How was your trip from Aurelia? And I was stunned at the time. Of course, I learned later that he had studied the photographs of the incoming class so that he would know them. I don't think to be cute, but rather to show through his own example that this was a culture where learning was going to be personalized and where people would do their homework and, and uh, work hard. Uh, and that memory has lasted throughout my life. During the school years, twice I remember, and we had a, this organization, anybody could belong to International Students Organization. He invited all of us together with faculty of our choice and other uh, members of the university uh, to his house on, at, on Park Street for a reception. And uh, that's how we get to know all other students. My father, Tom Bada, joined the Board of Trent in the 60s, so right at the beginning, um, very enthused by Professor Simon's vision for a small university that provided collaborative learning experience. And they became lifelong friends, uh, a friendship that my father really cherished as did we all, his great ability was to identify the goal and then to pull people together to actually achieve that goal. And he was always this very calm voice of wisdom 
listening to all of the uh, all of the points of view and helping people to understand each other's point of view. And that is that is such a, an amazing talent um, to have had. While still Dean of Devonshire House, Professor Simons would pass by the construction site of Massey College every day. He was enraptured by the beauty of that emerging structure, and on learning the name of its architect, he championed Ron Tom as the master planner and chief architect for what would become Trent University. The campus first took form with renovations and expansions of existing Peterborough buildings, which became Catherine Partrail College, Peter Robinson College, and Rubidge Hall. Working closely with Professors Simons and Dennis Smith, Ron Tom designed the university's flagship building, Champlain College, after a four-week tour of medieval and contemporary colleges in Great Britain. Despite visiting several new universities, the architect remained most impressed by Oxford and Cambridge universities, whose inward-facing courtyards generated a sense of haven and harmony for the students. Professor Simons worked with, or consigned his senior associates to, the Trent Commission, helping to design Lady Eaton College, the Battle Library, and the Reginald Farian Bridge. Molly Tom worked on procuring Trent's now legendary furniture, which comprised original designs by Ron Tom, as well as selections from world-renowned designers. Professor Simon served as Trent's president and vice chancellor for 11 years until 1972. In 1979, he was given the title of Vanier Professor, when he retired in 1994, he was made Vanier Professor Emeritus, and the Nassau Mills campus of the university was officially renamed in his honor. After retirement, Professor Simons remained an active member in the university community as the honorary president of the Alumni Association and of the Trent Legacy Society. He also continued as a member of the board of the Frost Center for Canadian Studies and Indigenous Studies, and gave guest lectures in various programs from history to chemistry. The thing that was so exciting was, was, was the endeavor. Uh, uh, the university really captain spirited uh, and, and, um, and inspired by, by Tom Simons uh, was, was to do a, a, a university that uh, really unlike the majority of the teaching facilities across Canada, uh, was much more based on a, on a smaller scale social unit, uh, uh, in, a, in a word, the college construct. But he didn't describe his purpose uh, or the endeavor in terms of uh, buildings, um, um, colleges or otherwise. He described it in terms of the student's experience. And, and what he consistently made clear was that he wanted to create uh, uh, or share in creating uh, a place where students and the tutors, the educators, the, the, the faculty uh, and staff and, and all of those who made up that learning experience could talk to each other, could spend time with each other and, and, and could share. And of course, that is always better done in small groups starting with one-to-one -one, uh, up to, uh, you know, a, a small tutorial uh, and, and into the seminar format. We, we called it at the time, and it still seems to be a kind of short form jargon for, for uh, the kind of thing Trent set out to be, which, which, which based on what, what I get euphemistically, we call the, the Oxbridge model, uh, which is uh, essentially in our, in our culture, a, a very old uh, idea. Um, of course, th those those uh, universities were were formed centuries ago, uh, starting in the early Middle Ages, and and they ostensibly were developed out of a model that had already evolved through through religious pursuits through the, the monastery, and and the college became a, a, a development and an adapt adaptation of monastery, and and that that was certainly understood that. It, it, it wasn't just a case of question and answer. It was a case about uh, the, the, the mind and the spirit and, and, and the body and, and, and all, of, all of what it is that makes up a, 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 the consequence of a person. And, and certainly um, 
uh, that uh, that 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 view that's that's at the root of Trent University that that Dr. Simons really brought to it fundamentally uh, kind of lives today and 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 always will I think. The thing about you know those early days of Trent it was just such a dynamic space. And of course, people have all heard about Ron Tom and how he went around the world and looked at different bits of architecture from Yale and of course, Durham and, and Oxford and Cambridge and other places. Uh, but Trent University then, not only was it run by the youngest university president in North America at the time, it, it had this really young architect and all these really young people encapsulating the spirit of the 60s. So you had Tom Simons, who had a very traditional sense of how education should be uh, and in coming into grips with the, kind of the new generation. And he was so fond of students. He loved students. And so he didn't want to turn his back on those new ideas. And so the architecture of the university embraced both that traditional sense and the importance of tradition in education with the idea of that new youthful energy of the 60s. And that is also a really special legacy of Trent University. It has both tradition at its core and the collegiate tradition, which is hundreds of years old, as well as the spirit of the 60s and the spirit of youth. And it continues to have that spirit. So I believe some of the best legacies of Trent University started right at the get-go and that's all because of Tom Simons. I think it was a miracle that he was the man who was chosen to um, lead the new university, to be the founder of this new university and to set the whole wonderful adventure in motion that, that was Trent, that is Trent. He was able to gather together um, really remarkable, a remarkable group of, of committed and passionate advocates for, to support his vision. And, uh, but he was the leader. He was the one who put it all together. Personal, professional memories of Tom that I'm very fond of too. Um, I think the, the most powerful of those is the, uh, the opening of Champlain College, which I think must have been one of the great days of Tom's life because it brought together so many of the things that he represented and that he cared about. Uh, he and Dennis Smith uh, had chosen the name of Champlain College very deliberately to um, uh, embody and express the partnership between French and English speaking people in the founding of this country. And for the opening of Champlain College, Tom succeeded and only Tom could have done it in bringing together the premier of Ontario, John Robarts, and the premier of Quebec, the great Jean Lesage. And, um, Tom was between them for the laying of the cornerstone of Champlain College. And that moment for me expressed everything about Tom and about Canada that he cared about. Uh, that sense of uh, unity and, uh, and community that he saw in Canada and that he wanted to express in Trent and in the founding of, of Champlain College. The fact that Professor Simons held a deep love for Canada is no surprise to anyone who knew him. Indeed, the breadth of his commitment to almost every facet of Canadian life was remarkable. From 1968 to 75, he served as the chairman of the Policy Advisory Committee for Robert Stanfield, leader of the opposition. From 1972 to 75, he famously led a National Commission on Canadian Studies. Its published findings, entitled To Know Ourselves, or the Simons Report, inspired a generation of scholars, policymakers, and citizens dedicated to the study of Canada. In 1976, his efforts led to his investment as a member of the Order of Canada, later promoted to Companion, and later his election as a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He served as chairman on numerous federal committees and institutions, including the National Commission on Canadian Studies, the National Library Advisory Board, and the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada. He also served on the National Statistics Council of Canada, the Canada Council, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and many others. 
Additionally, a medal and an annual lecture entitled the Simons Lecture on the State of Canadian Confederation were created in his honor at the Confederation Center of the Arts on Prince Edward Island. In 2016, Professor Simons received the Gabriel Leger Medal from the National Trust for Canada in recognition of his lifetime contribution and leadership in heritage conservation in Canada. It was under Professor Simons that Trent University created the first Indigenous Studies program in the country, soon followed by the Canadian Studies program and the groundbreaking Journal of Canadian Studies. I think Tom Simons is synonymous with Canadian culture and Canadian st studies. The name of Tom Simons is integral and as his life was integral into Canadian studies and the study of Canadian culture. Tom Simons was born in a really transitional era and a transitional era that brought us through the Second World War and before the Second World War in fact um, there weren't Canadian citizens and Mackenzie King uh, the Prime Minister was Canadian citizen number one. And so Tom Simons got to see this transition close up, a Canada that through its metal in conflict, through its expansion in population, through its growing culture, was getting a deeper sense of what it was. And Tom Simons was on the front lines of that. Now, the Massey Commission was huge, and it was the first real documentation uh, of where Canada should be as a cultural place and where, you know, where it is and where it should go. And then Tom Simons, you know, a decade later, uh, was instrumental in the creation of Trent University, a university that could make the rubber hit the road in many ways. And indeed, he did that, right? He, because he created the first school for Indigenous studies in the country. And he made we created one of the first schools of Canadian studies in, in the country and made Canadian studies a topic worth, you know, exploring. And these were all institutions, of course, that were very near and dear to his heart. He was the chair of the National Historic Sites and Monuments Board. He was the chair of the Ontario Heritage Trust. You know, his work with the National Library, with Stats Can, he, you name it, if there was a Canadian institution that embraced culture and embraced what Canada was, Tom Simon's not only was a part of it, he probably often shared it or ran it, which is such an important legacy of his. This is such a bittersweet moment for me as I think about Professor Tom Simons. You know, I have known him for decades. Actually, when I was involved in culture and education matters for the province of Saskatchewan, and he was first introduced to me as Mr. Canadian Studies. Uh, and that has always stuck with me. Um, it is important because he was recognized as the person who challenged all of us to think about what it means to be a Canadian. I was privileged to be Trent's liaison on the Simons Commission, the, the, the To Know Ourselves uh, Committee on the study on the on Canadian studies back in 1970, in the 1970s, early 1970s. And if you go through the uh, recommendations of the report. If you go through it, it's it's just replete with recommendations for stepping past uh, the accepted uh, protocols for academic life that have been ordained by British and American universities. He was adamant that Canada should be developing its own ways of looking at the world and uh, and our our place in it, uh, and and. He wanted to make sure that we were aware of uh, the the richness and and uh, of the cultures that 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 were here, and certainly the, especially the the richness of the culture that introduced that we were introduced to that was the hospitality that welcomed people who came from other places to live here. So the importance of indigenous uh, issues, the importance of indigenous studies, the importance of uh, of, of, of the privilege of entering into this world had to be also paralleled in academic discourse by an awareness that there were different ways of looking at things. And one of, I'll give you one example because it became a guide for everything that happened in the program that I was involved in. And that was introducing interdisciplinarity into the, into the academic discourse. Canadian Studies program was the first interdisciplinary program at the university, and we were starting green 
uh, from scratch, basically. Uh, and Tom, in, if you if you read his document, you will find references to trying new methodologies, new theoretical tools that spontaneously sprang from the the place that we occupy here, uh, and and learning from the culture. First of all, the culture cultures that were uh, our guides to to life. Initial the initial. Uh, occupants of the land, we had to learn from them. In 1969, Trent University became the first university in Canada, and only the second in North America, to establish an academic department dedicated to the study of Aboriginal peoples. Co-founded by Professor Simons, Dr. Harvey McHugh, Dr. Kenneth Kidd, and others, the Indian Eskimo Studies program led the way for other programs in Canada. Trent's incorporation of Indigenous teachings and history into its interdisciplinary programs, such as Canadian Studies, has been critical in the development of the university. And it all began with recognizing the land the university was to be built on and the people who lived there. Well, for me, you know, it's been a, a privilege for me to, to know Dr. Simons or Professor Simons. And even we were great friends over the many years. But this whole process of friendship began over 50 years ago when the uh, university itself was in its infant stage and under discussion. And the former chief of ours, Dalton Jacobs, he uh, was a, one of the first, I believe, that approached and went into Dr. Uh, Professor Simon's uh, office and made a $2 donation towards the university. And then that began the whole friendship process process over the years. And uh, where things really came to light was 50 years ago or so that uh, they made the, a walk from uh, the site, I believe, at Trent University, where it is there now, to Curve Lake as a co-fundraiser. Uh, Part, partly for Curve Lake and part for another organization that uh, Professor uh, Simons was uh, working for. So that began the, uh, the beginning of our relationships. And uh, that carried on right through to up to now. And I think the uh, memory and the relationship will continue. The, uh, I believe it's the uh, this past September, or a year ago this September? I think this past September. It was the fall of 1967. Uh, I was in third year at Trent, and I was uh, starting the year as the president of the Champlain College uh, Student Council. And shortly after Thanksgiving, I received a note from the president's office asking me to uh, meet him. Uh, to discuss uh, a matter of great importance, as, as, as he indicated in the note. And um, so we met, and uh, he told me that he wanted to contribute to uh, uh, Native people, as, as the term was used in those days. As the president of the university, he wondered how he might best do that. And so uh, we had uh, several conversations over the course of about two weeks. And uh, we agreed that the university could best contribute to uh, the interests and concerns of indigenous people by uh, creating a program of studies at the university uh, that focused on and spoke to uh, indigenous uh, topics and concerns and that would appeal to uh, indigenous students to uh, come to Trent and uh, commence with their studies. So that that was that was the first um, first meeting that I had with Tom, and uh, it turned out to be uh, a very special and very important meeting because in um, in 1969, of course, the university started with the first uh, Native Studies program uh, ever uh, in the country. There, he will have many legacies because of his uh, uh, his work, uh, his global work, really. Uh, but in 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 my mind and in the minds of many people, uh, an important legacy 
if not one of the most important legacies, will be uh, his commitment and dedication to uh, creating uh, Indigenous studies at, at the university. Uh, it was it was done in in, in 1969, um, uh, and uh, uh, you know, Indigenous people didn't figure very uh, very highly on uh, in in university campuses campuses across the country and uh it was it was totally unheard of in at that time for any university in the country to be looking seriously at creating a program of studies uh, on indigenous people and uh it it is it, it's even debatable uh, uh whether or not indigenous studies would have emerged on university campuses in this country if it weren't for uh tom's uh vision and commitment and uh and and dedication to uh, making that happen so i i think that if that will be uh one of his enduring legacies uh um, i i'm 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 certain of that that notion of what does it mean to be canadian is so important it included of course his profound commitment to encouraging all of us to learn about and embrace the traditional knowledge of Indigenous peoples. He saw the, the people of Curve Lake, for example, as integral partners in the creation of Trent University. So it was very close to the origin of who we are. Professor Simons was a prominent figure within the Peterborough community. He served on the board of directors for the Peterborough Red Cross and Community Fund, as well as serving as a founding member of the Autonomy Region Conservation Foundation and the Greater Peterborough Economic Council. He was a founding committee member of the Canadian Canoe Museum, honorary president of the Peterborough Historical Society, and a member of the Board of Governors of Sir Sanford Fleming College. From 2005 to 2010, Professor Simons was chairman of the Peterborough Lakefield Police Services Board. Additionally, he was a member of the Mayor's Committee on Peterborough's Economic Prospects. In 2004, Mayor Sylvia Sutherland presented Professor Simons with a key to the city. But he was also widely recognized as both a national and international figure. In 2002, Professor Simons was awarded the Order of Ontario. As Ontario's Commissioner of Human Rights from 1975 to 78, he spearheaded major revisions to the province's code notably in the area of civil rights for homosexuals. Additionally, he chaired the Ontario Heritage Trust for eight years and was on the Board of Governors of the Ontario Medical Foundation, the Ontario Arts Council, the Advisory Committee for Heritage Ontario, the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, and was a founding member of Heritage Canada to list a few of his activities. Internationally, Professor Simons distinguished himself through his work as Chairman of the Association of Commonwealth Universities and Chairman of the International Board and Vice President of the International Council of United World Colleges. In 1982, he was awarded the Distinguished Service to Education Award of the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education. He was named Fellow by Oriel College, Oxford University, and a Visiting Scholar and Fellow by Cambridge University. He's the recipient of 13 honorary degrees from universities and colleges across Canada and the recipient of both the Queen Elizabeth II Golden and Diamond Jubilee Medals. In addition to the creation of Trent University, Professor Simons was instrumental in the founding of Fleming College and more than a dozen other colleges and universities around the world. His efforts in the creation of Peterborough's Sacred Heart College resulted in a knighthood from the Vatican in the Order of St. Sylvester in 2012. The the importance that Tom always had of the integration of him, of the city and the university. From the very beginning, he knew it was important that the university reach out to the city so that city felt part of the university and the university part of it. And that went even down to the collection at, at the General Electric of dimes and Coke bottles after Tom had been there to speak to workers and that. Tom was on the hiring committee, actually, that uh, that determined the presidency of Sir Sanford Fleming College. And um, there and Tom and David had a, a, a very warm and close and good relationship. And that and how that reflected in the community was that there was a, a relationship between Sir Sanford Fleming College and Trent University 
that was unique in the communities, I think, in Ontario that had both the university, and there aren't that many, that had both the university and the college. Tom served on the board at, at Sir Sanford Fleming. David served on the board at Trent University. But they worked remarkably well together, certainly to the benefit of the college and the and the university. And that and that, if you speak to anyone who was around in those days, and there's fewer of us all the time, I think they'll point out that that, that was a quite a unique situation, that close relationship between the two post-secondary educational institutions in Peterborough. And uh, and that really was Tom and his appreciation of the type of education the college was offering, as well as I think his appreciation and friendship with the founding president. The students caught that too a sense of bringing something new to Peterborough, very aware of themselves going around town with their green gowns still on and not high school blazers, you know, um, and very aware that Peterborough was interested in them and taking, taking notice. It's amazing to see all the advertisements from Peterborough uh, shops and businesses in the first yearbooks the students produced. Everybody seemed to want to be present in that first in those first yearbooks. It certainly is true that in Peterborough we now have a small city crowded with students during terms. Sir Sanford Fleming as well as Trent and Tom had a, a important hand in bringing about the Sacred Heart College as well. The small city is a city full of students and teachers uh, now, and that is very special. I, I always admired how much he loved Peterborough and how much it meant to him and how um, he continued to live and participate in this community after his retirement. Um, retirement from the university uh, and I think we shared that love of Peterborough and it was wonderful for me to see that somebody had made this city their home base um, and that they cared about its heritage and its citizens so much but yet at the same time um, they were also very broadly connected to other um, projects and other people both nationally but also all around the world. But he also took his passion for education to the international scene. You know, he became a friend, I would say, of the Prince of Wales and very much instrumental in the association of Commonwealth universities and the development of Commonwealth studies. So his love of Canada and his questioning about Canada's place in the world actually was taken much beyond the local area, the provincial area, the federal jurisdiction and, and of course, uh, international. He made a contribution to all of those uh, orders of government and places in the world. What was Tom Simon's greatest legacy? If I were to point to one thing, almost impossible, because there were so many contributions by him to the country and to the world, uh, I, I would... I would say set aside his founding of a university and, and, and other educational institutions, the pivotal role he played in the founding of the, the, the Pearson Pacific College of the Pacific and all those things, uh, all the, 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 the visionary and insightful and futuristic reports that he authored uh, on Canadian studies and human rights and, and indigenous peoples. And I mean, it's a big set aside, but I, I would set all those things aside in favor of stressing that he provided for us Canadians now and forever a model of what it meant to be and means to be a citizen and the obligations of citizenship to others, to the total community. The foremost obligation being that to, to contribute to the community, to make it stronger. And, and Tom Simons' greatest strength, I have no doubt about this, Tom Simons' 
greatest strength was community building. He, he, he had a gift that bordered on magic for bringing people together, people of diverse backgrounds and often discordant pers personalities and views and, and making teams of these people in pursuit of, of noble public goals. I was a young man and I had a lot to learn and I learned an awful lot from this, this grand master of the Socratic method. Uh, and and that's all by way of saying that uh, he, just as he wasn't a rabbit Tory, but it was a citizen Tory, he was an exemplary citizen of Canada, certainly of Peterborough, of Ontario, of, Can of Canada and the world. And because he, he, he had bred into his very fiber uh, what I would liken to the, 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 the Roman notion of a civitas, citizenship. The basic Roman concept of, of citizenship being the highest value of a community, I thought Tom Simons embodied. And, and, and he manifested it and made it real through all the public services he rendered, the selfless public services he rendered in so many different facets of our own country and, and of the world as a whole. If Tom's, one of Tom's great gifts was his gift for friendship, he was able to turn that gift for friendship into a gift for the creating of community. Wherever Tom was, um, whether it was a Devonshire house or Trent University, or the Commission on Canadian Studies, or the National Library Board, or the uh, Ontario Human Rights Commission, or the um, uh, Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada, or any other group or organization, Tom's first instinct was to see it as a community. And then his second was to help it achieve a greater sense of community, to be a better community than it already was. And I think he did that for, for Canada also, through uh, his work on Canadian studies, through all his work in uh, public policy, uh, through his work in bringing the two language groups together uh, in uh, Ontario and uh, uh, in Canada. Tom helped Canada to be a community, but he helped all the other institutions and organizations and groups of friends of which he was a part to be um, a better community. And I think the, the, the tribute to that is that um, uh, 56 years after the founding of Trent, uh, on his 90th birthday, uh, more than 500 people wanted to gather uh, at Trent to, uh, to thank him and to tell him what they had done for him, uh, for themselves personally, but what they had done for, for their community, for Trent and for the Trent uh, community, is that Tom provided us and provided Canada with a model of public service. He devoted his whole life to various forms of public service. Um, I suppose the founding of Trent itself was a kind of public service, but even while he was at Trent, uh, he was already heavily engaged in, uh, in acts and forms and activities of public service, whether it was as the uh, policy advisor to a national political party, to uh, as an advisor to the Premier of Ontario on the National Unity Challenge, uh, in his role as chair of the Simons Commissions investigating and mediating uh, disputes over language rights and education in Ontario. Um, in, and then in innumerable other ways, 
he was such a, a Canadian and um, he really instilled this being a Canadian and being what it meant to be and how it made us unique and different and how to carry that sensibility wherever we went around the world. When I say we, I, I speak uh, about my brothers and myself. And for me, um, we've all gone our separate uh, in our separate directions all over the world. And I've certainly carried that pride of being a Canadian and always loving coming home to Canada. And I know that was a feeling my father always had, no matter where he was in the Commonwealth. And he would, he was always so happy to come home and to come home to his community in Peterborough. I know that was incredibly important to him. He, he always enjoyed uh, being there. He was a Toronto boy originally, but um, he, he certainly loved um, Peterborough and Marchbanks and Trent and uh, the community that surrounded him there. It was a wonderful, wonderful gift to have in life when that happens. We have these political figures, uh, Diefen Baker. I even remember Rene Levesque and his swirling cigarette smoke in, at our home and um, political figures all, you know, Oh, certainly Bob Stanfield, political figures were always at Marchbanks. And travel to, the, to London, which I, I think is safe to say uh, was his favorite city in the world, came young, uh, at a young age for all of, of my, my brothers and myself. And so London was a place we all felt very um, at home in and often spent, my parents would spend ex, you know, extended amounts of time in England and um, London became a, a second home in a way and still is, uh, I think, <laughs> for me anyway. Um, <clears throat> but my father would include the children um, in wonderful things. And so I remember having bun fight in some castle with John Fraser and uh, Prince Charles was a guest and John had instigated a bun fight. Um, I think he was the Globe and Mail uh, correspondent in, in London or Paris at that time. It was quite something. So it, we always had interesting people. And um, you know, one night I would be having dinner with Prince Sidrudin Aga Khan and the next, uh, you know, with great friends of my father's that um, did interesting things in many varying fields. and. And yes, great, great opportunities um, to meet and to see the great work that, um, that my father was doing and the great work um, in education that so many other people were doing. Really a wonderful opportunities and... Um... Professor Simons possessed an unparalleled passion for scholarship, his community and his country. His vision for the nation was one where all Canadians could know themselves through an appreciation of their past and through a mutual understanding of their shared present. In doing so, it was his sincerest wish the Canadians would find both the inspiration and hope required to face the future together. On his personal journey to humbly know more, he touched the lives of countless people. He was passionate in his lifelong role as a scholar, teacher, mentor, and leader. When I came to Trent University as a historian and someone who had worked for the federal government, meeting Tom Simons was one of the most incredible moments of my life. And I first met him just uh, through a cold call. He didn't know who I was. I was a young lecturer, um, still a PhD student and hadn't uh, finished my uh, studies. And so he didn't know me from anyone. And I, and I very nervously called him up one day and asked, um, would you be able to give a guest spot, a guest lecture, because you know so much about national historic sites and monuments and Ontario monuments, would you talk about heritage and history and the importance of that to my students? And I had fully expected him to be too busy to take any interest. And he said, of course, I would love to. And that meant the world to me. And it opened my eyes to how much he loved teaching, how much he loved students. And right even to the, his final days, he was so interested in how what students thought and if he could take on another student if he could have just one more student that he could give a seminar to and that was so important for him because he truly loved young people and the ideas the fresh ideas that they could bring to perhaps some of the stuff, stuffy corners of academia i think uh people speak a lot about him bringing the student experience 
particularly because they think of him in, in response to uh, the educational aspect of, of what he did. And I, as a personal comment, would just say that he extended that personal experience to the way in which he interacted with everyone. I thought of myself as one of his students, and I must say that I learned with every encounter I ever had with him. In many ways, he was a mentor. Um, he was always thinking about ways in which we could be mischievous, and he would respecting the limits, particularly of the position that I'm in right now, but he'd always push at the edges. His resilience was just remarkable, and every encounter I had with him left me full of energy, totally recharged. I met uh, Tom Simons in uh, unique circumstances. I became president of the university on the 50th anniversary right. of Trent University. And I will say it was a, a little bit of a surreal situation because I was the new president, but being the president of the university, I was the host of the 50th anniversary celebrations of Trent University. But I had just arrived at the university. I didn't know the people. I didn't know the traditions. I didn't know where the skeletons were buried. And in that circumstance, that's the circumstance in which I got to know Tom Simons. And I wouldn't say he took me under uh, his wing, but he did make an effort to help me get through that time by telling me about the history of Trent, by introducing me to people, and by talking about what Trent was, what he wanted it to be, also a little bit uh, what other people wanted uh, it to be. And, uh, and I'm indebted to him for that help when I first came to the university. My first contact with Dr. Simons was when I was a graduate student uh, in the Canadian Indigenous Studies program. And uh, of course, everybody knew who he was and uh, everybody knew the incredible contribution that he made to Trent University, but to other universities. But then when I became a board member uh, about five years ago, six years ago, uh, he was one of the very early individuals to reach out to and thank you. and. Uh, he, um, as I said, was a prolific note writer, would often scribble a note to you and just say, you know, thank you, congratulations, and what have you. And he was, he was just the type of guy that was always there. He seemed to be a, a presence in Trent University and was, right from his founding, and, uh, and, and uh, always tried to enable and help individuals that had taken on leadership positions, myself included, uh, on the board. Just a tremendous source of inspiration and uh, of insight as well. Professor Simon's genuine desire um, to obtain comment and suggestions from you as an assistant if you were working together, be it on remarks that he was putting together or a forward that he might be working on for a publication or a report that he was doing, he genuinely wanted you to provide um, your own suggestions and comments, and they often served as a point of departure for discussion. They weren't necessarily always incorporated into the final draft, and that really didn't matter because, again, it was about that dialogue and that ability um, to work together uh, towards whatever goal was in mind. So my first personal memory was actually at our home when Professor Simons, president of Trent University, was coming for lunch. As a young teenager, I was rather dreading what I thought would be a long meal, sitting quietly, listening to dry, formal, academic conversation. And instead, I remember twinkling eyes. I remember warmth and laughter. And I have a lasting memory of how valued he made me feel and how genuinely interested he was in my thoughts and opinions and how honored I felt. And I believe he touched many, many people throughout his life in exactly this way, giving them a feeling of self-worth, of pushing them gently to go for it. And I was really fortunate that I had many ongoing opportunities to benefit from this wisdom and probing questions and encouragement as he played significant roles um, in my family's business, museum, and, and in my life uh, for many years after that. Tom was the honorary president of the Alumni Association for decades, a role he was deeply committed to. He believed strongly in maintaining alumni connections, and he was a role model for each TUAA president 
as well as the directors of the alumni office, he was my trusted mentor. It was teaching and it was making sure that education was accessible and that people loved the time that they spent getting educated. He loved to teach, he loved his students. Um, he, he just truly, that was, that was his greatest pleasure, was teaching and spending time with students, was mentoring students, was helping them to get into their programs they wanted to do and really encouraging students to carry on with their education and to do their undergraduate degree if they were in Canada, do it in Canada, and then go on and do your, your postgraduate degrees how, wherever you want. But if you were a Canadian, stay in Canada and do your undergraduate degree here. Tom had a wonderful ability, as I've just I've already said, I think, to um, uh, relate to young people, and in particular to give them uh, spontaneously and naturally a sense of confidence in themselves, a kind of belief in themselves, perhaps just by the way in which he took them seriously and uh, listened to them, uh, uh, conveyed to them that maybe they were significant people, that they had things to do and, uh, and roles to play in life. It was a wonderful gift that he had to, to convey that to people, and it changed my life, and I'm I think it changed uh, many others. As much as he was known for his roles in scholarship, teaching, and leading, those who knew Professor Simons best recognized him as warm, gracious, ever curious, self-effacing, and kind. He held friendships as sacred and nurtured them over decades. His sense of conviviality helped shape many of Trent's earliest traditions, and made him an always respected host and lifelong friend. The fire was the place that you um, that you probably met with my father um, if you were coming for a visit. He loved to sit in the living room. He loved to sit by the fire. We often ate dinners by the fire. Um, that was the hub of the house. He also enjoyed sitting in the kitchen with my mother in the mornings in his later years. And of course, he would still go to his you know, unbelievable office. Uh, I don't know how he got through all the papers. I don't know how he got got to his desk. It's piled this high um, all the time, but that was how he operated. Um, but definitely anytime you went to March Banks and any time that was spent there in the last few decades, it was, it was by the fire for sure. My experience with Tom was drinking scotch. And uh, I have wonderful fond memories of being at March Banks in the evening, having a scotch with Tom and with Christine and with Glennis. The fire is crackling and we're talking about everything. Tom was a wonderful conversationalist. Uh, I think uh, what I enjoyed the most was talking about Canadian history, which he knew like the back of his hand. But uh, I will just say those were marvelous evenings and, uh, and I will miss them going forward. And Tom Simons is one of these wonderful people who was brilliant, a scholar to the end, and he enjoyed people and having fun. He was so good to my family. We would always go out uh, and, and bring a bar have a barbecue with him. And I would say, well, what would you like? Would you like steaks? Would you like, you know, fancy uh, sausages or things like that? And he said, no, no, just a hot dog. I love a good barbecued hot dog. And I think that in itself is so indicative of how special and complex Tom Simons was. A brilliant scholar, connected to the government, internationally known, someone who could be quite intimidating and not down to earth at all, but he knew the value of conversation and having a good hot dog. You know, the one thing that he always, always, always did was when he spoke, he always talked about the support that Christine had given him throughout the years. And, you know, <laughs> I guess as a wife, that just meant <laughs> a lot to me. I think the memory that stands out the most uh, for me is the uh, evening when uh, the Department of Indigenous Studies uh, made uh, Tom and I uh, honorary elders. And as part of that uh, delightful ceremony, uh, Paul Martin, uh, former Prime Minister of Canada, was invited to, uh, to speak to the assembly. 
And after, uh, after the uh, speeches and the induction of uh, Tom and I as honorary elders, uh, we went to a small lecture room to uh, answer questions. And so there was the, there were the three of us on the stage. There was uh, Paul Martin, uh, Tom Simons, uh, and and myself. And at one point, gifts were given out, which included uh, Trent sunglasses. And and each of us each of us put on uh, the sunglasses simultaneously, and 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 we burst out laughing. And there's a delightful photograph of the three of us uh, having a great chuckle with these uh, Trent uh, sunglasses on. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a favorite memory that I have of, of Tom. Uh, uh, he, he and between uh, Paul Martin and myself uh, enjoying uh, a good chuckle. And as everyone knows, uh, Tom uh, liked uh, a, a good chuckle and a, and a hearty laugh. Uh, THB's memory for people, which was amazing. Um, at Trent's 50th reunion, I was in line to speak to him. And when I got up there, I was about to give him my name and show him my badge. I hadn't seen him in 45 years. And, um, you know, you always want to not leave people fumbling for names. Uh, before I could do that, he reached out his hand and he said, well, Miss Finlayson, and how are you? Uh, I was absolutely floored 45 years later. His greatest gift was his gift for friendship. And... His, friend, his gift for friendship never showed itself more powerfully and emotionally and dramatically than in the breaking of bread together, in having meals together. Um, his sharing of meals with people was infused with uh, his spirit of friendship, with his great uh, enjoyment of life and his enjoyment of, of people. And that was uh, not only delightful for all the people who got to spend time with him uh, have, enjoying a meal together, uh, but was in a f curious way inspiring. Uh, it filled you with uh, a spirit of life and, uh, and love and friendship and, um, and uh, was like putting gas in your tank for, for, for life. There was nothing that I enjoyed more than stopping at his home, surrounded by books, music, and wonderful, wonderful conversation. He was so gracious and generous with his intellect and with his broad knowledge. He was a master of civility and kindness. And his love of family and his devotion to Christine came through. She was always there in our conversations, always at his side, and he recognized his, his good fortune. So for me, uh, and with many others, we recognize him obviously as an inspirational leader, both at home and abroad. But for me, he was first and foremost, a most loyal friend and will be sincerely missed. Friends and colleagues were asked to describe Professor Simons in a word. This is how they remembered him. Many people have asked me about Tom's uh, legacy. And I do like to say that Tom's legacy for those of us at Trent is us. Uh, without Tom, there wouldn't be Trent University and it wouldn't have become what it's uh, become. He laid the pathway that made it possible for all of us to be here, to do the work that we do, to teach the students, to do the research, to have the wonderful conversations, to enjoy the river and uh, the campus that he and, and others uh, built. So in my mind, Tom's great legacy is Trent University, I think I have to say that because I'm president of the university, but I really do think that's kind of the jewel in the crown of what he did, and it's thriving, and it's doing well, and I think it's not exactly, but it's staying very true to the core values that he had, and I think he would be very pleased with that. I would describe Professor Tom Simons in one word, using the word humility. There, here's a man with 13 honorary degrees, uh, a man that had an Order of Canada, a man that had an Order of Ontario, 
was invested as a knight in the Order of St. Sylvester, had a role to play in founding a dozen other universities and colleges. And, uh, and, and uh, this was a man that you wouldn't know of any of those accomplishments if you didn't know who he was. And this was a man that was able to relate to any individual that he encountered, and especially like talking to students. And I watched him at different dinners at Trail College and uh, his interacting with uh, young undergraduate students and graduate students. And, uh, and, and he had a real passion to know what their research interests were and what they were studying. And uh, um, he was just such a humble individual that uh, he just inspired you with his humility and, uh, and, and uh, was, was a fascinating individual to be around. I think caring is the word I would most describe because I think his real legacy actually lies in all of those whose lives he touched and that he really did care. And the students that he encouraged and his infectious love of Canada and its people and its culture and simply being an inspiring role model. It would be something about leadership. That's the context in which I knew him as a leader who who's, who had a vision and who could inspire that vision in others until they became with him a team wanting to make that vision happen. He was very compassionate, soft-spoken, and he liked to listen to whoever he is uh, talking to. And, and uh, he took your advice your advice or your suggestions or the dis discussion you have at the time to heart. And uh, an individual really felt comfortable, real comfortable when you're, when you were with him. I'll always remember Professor Simon of his uh, compassion, his uh, soft spoken voice, his laughter. One word kept jumping out, and it was absolutely accurate. It was the word kind. One, one person, former editor of the Arthur said, I think Tom Simons, is THB Simons, was the kindest man I'll ever meet. And there was to Tom an immense kindness to everyone. And then one other, can I do one other description of Tom? I often thought he was the last Edwardian. Tom enjoyed life. He enjoyed fun, he enjoyed the good things of life, he enjoyed, he enjoyed living, and he also was endlessly courteous. Yeah, the singular word that I would use to describe Tom is as a pollinator. The myriad of organizations, institutions, and initiatives he was involved in, he brought a unique set of sensibilities that allowed them to bear fruit. Uh, they included respect, rigor, enthusiasm, and a positive inclination for the benefit of mankind. He's left behind a very verdant garden, and for that we should be so thankful. I actually would like to say the word joy, because I think he also had a tremendous ability to find joy, and other people certainly have commented on this in various capacities, but to find joy both in simple and complex aspects of life. Um, we would go outside into the garden sometimes here and have a look at his squash or have a look at a beautiful tree or bush that he and Mrs. Simons had just planted. And he would take great joy in that. Um, and he said to me when I was just, you know, reaching a point where I was trying to figure out a little bit about what else I would like to do professionally, he said, you need to make sure you do something that brings you joy. And I think that that's what he was so terribly good at, was finding the joy in all of the work that he was doing and all of the interactions he pursued. And I think that it came through in the way in which he interacted with people and the, and the um, impression that he made on them as well. So joy is my word of choice. Gracious. Just, I would say that he, he had great grace uh, in his in his dealing with uh, with other people, with the students, with uh, uh, with his colleagues, uh, with uh, the public at large. Uh, always sensitive and uh, and warm. You know, he 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 was he was. Uh, in, in some ways, he was very formal, 
but there was a degree of informality to Tom that uh, enabled people from all cuts of cloth to feel very comfortable in his presence. Uh, he he had a he had a, a special uh, talent, uh, if not a knack, to put people, uh, total strangers, uh, at ease very quickly. And uh, I, uh, I I I marveled at his ability to do that. I think friend, <laughs> friend, uh, I, 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 Tom, Tom would make. I think everybody who entered his life, uh, or entered his in, into into his into his world, uh, make make them feel like a friend, <laughs> and uh, that that was uh, that would be my 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 first word. Gentlemen, he represented. Uh, the the classic definition of a gentleman by Cardinal Newman in uh, in 18, 1850 or so uh, a, a, a person who doesn't inflict pain on others and I think the, the corollary of that is is that a gentleman makes other people's lives as pain-free as it's possible to do. And that's what he did. He, 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 he devoted his life to selfless service. Kindness. I think that there's not another word that can sum up, well, there's many words that can sum up my father, but he was the personification of kindness. But he never stopped being social was always a whirlwind. Wherever dad was, he'd set up a big study in his cottage on at, at Shaw's Hotel, and a work area rather. And oh my goodness, I mean, I felt for my mother, there was always people coming. There was always, um, he did learn how to use a cell phone because he had to if he wanted to communicate. And that was always going. I think he had one or two. And uh, he just was a, a people person and uh, he loved he loved his life and he had a, a great one and it was 91 years of being active really up until um up until the very end and so i'm i'm really grateful for that he just had a full and rich life <laughs>